Hi, everyone. Uh, we're back. How did you enjoy the movie? Wasn't it terrific? Well, we have a big surprise for you. We have the new editorial director for The Hollywood Reporter, my dear friend, Nikessa Moody, who is going to speak to the uh, Anjanu and the creative team responsible for this wonderful film. Uh, Nikessa? Uh, it's such a great movie. Um, so riveting, so great. Um, I wanna start with Holly. If you can talk a little bit about what made you wanna bring this story to light. Obviously there's so much drama there, but did you kind of have a sense of how um, how how interesting and how um, how much how deep it was before um, it was brought to you? Um, you know, I wanted to do this story because it was representative of women. Uh, it was representative of faith and obviously being out of the Church of God in Christ myself, a Kojic baby, a Kojic darling, as they say, um, I knew of the story of the Clark sisters and um, I knew of the journey of their mother, uh, which is the main reason why I went in because she was such a force in music in the Church of God in Christ. And to be able to tell her story was something that I had always in, you know, inspired I was inspired to do but even in addition to that the music of her daughters uh, I grew up with and grew up on and I, I knew that her story with their story with the bigger story of fighting for your dreams and fighting to keep your family together and fighting to push the music you know the gospel out of you um, was something that was it just connected with me personally. And as we went along years as years would have it, that's when I found out the real drama that was going on in the Clark household. And so I was, um, you know, I knew that it would be a, a, a great story. And was it a hard sell to kind of bring this to any network, but because, you know, it is a gospel story, you know, it's not necessarily, um, you know, Tina Turner or that type of thing. What was the, was there a hurdle that you had, hurdles you had to go through? Uh, yes, I had, there were plenty of hurdles because at the end of the day, you know, gospel, gospel stories haven't always resonated because they weren't always um, relatable. A lot of times we felt like uh, a lot of times we felt like uh, people felt like we couldn't relate to stories of faith and stories of church. But what was different about this is the stories were relatable. It, we dealt with sibling rivalry. We dealt with mental illness. We dealt with domestic violence. And these were things that every family, no matter what color, no matter what race, no matter what, you know, what, what religion you were, you could, um, you know, you could, you could uh, relate to. And while it was hard, um, it began to, you know, to, as I said, along, along this journey, timing is everything, but God's timing is perfect. We had to get to a time where this story made sense. We had to get to a time where people were open to stories of inspiration. And so I think that's what made it hard because we were not where we are now. And now, you know, is the perfect time for a story like this to come up front and center and help to inspire a nation of people who are hurting. Mm -hmm. Christine, what drew you to want to helm this project? Um, for my whole career, um, I've been telling stories of inspiration. And I don't think the Clark sisters' story is any different from um, stories that I, I did a, a biopic about Mickey Howard. And here was this. A uh, woman who came from the same types of circumstances that I came from and had something significant to contribute in life as a singer and, and beyond. And um, I just connect with that part of Black women who are significant in, in great things that they have to contribute to our culture. And I never, this is interesting though, I never saw the Clark sisters as a gospel story. I don't see it any different 
from the Mickey Howard story. The, this, it was a story about uh, women of great um, talent and, and resilience who had to work against obstacles that they were facing um, that they did not always create. Some they created, some they didn't. So it's, it's about how we as Black women have to overcome certain things in our culture um, for our life to, to be seen. And my job as, as the director was to make sure that the, the light was properly placed on them in such a way that it connected with audiences as an inspirational story that just happens to be about gospel singers. But there's nothing about it that could not resonate because the story is in many ways universal while at the same time being unique and distinct. Now, what was the kind of decision to make Miss um, Clark, uh, Maddie Clark, the se central figure? There's so many different figures that could have maybe been the anchor, but obviously um, Ingenue's performance was amazing and she um, anchored the, the whole, the movie, but what was the decision to tell it through her eyes in many ways? There's so many components to the storytelling because there are so many different characters. So I, I think we should look at it now, like how could we have done it any differently, you know, um, with, with an ingenue Ellis at the helm? Like what other way could we have possibly imagined it that would have worked in the magnificent, magnificent way that it's worked and worked with ingenue? So I, I just think that was like the anchor that was pushing the story all along. And our jobs as creative people is sometimes is, is to follow uh, the, the path of the, of the visionary way. And the path of the visionary way led to Anjanu Ellis. And the rest of us were just obedient um, to, to that great storytelling that starred her as, as the lead uh, matriarch in the story. Uh, Anjanu, um you have gotten so much acclaim, rightly so, for your brilliant performance. I was reading something where Christine said you were, I believe, in a good way, possessed by um, Maddie. Ta take me through your preparation um, to play such an um, a, a, um, important figure with humanity. Like, she was very strong and very, um, you know, could be very difficult, but you gave her her humanity as well. Um, I leaned into the difficult part of her. I leaned into that. I leaned into everything about Dr. Maddie that uh, some people would say would make her difficult, uh, would make her um, hard to deal with, um, that would make her uncomfortable to people. I leaned into that as, as much as I could because for Dr. Maddie, that was her way of making people better by making them uncomfortable, by destabilizing their, their sense of self, their sense of comfort. She had to destabilize that and she did that by throwing shoes. She did that by yelling, you know? She did that by making people question who they are. She tore them down so she could build them back, back up again. Um, and so one of the, a few things that I had to do, I had to, I had to work from the outside in. And I love doing that as an, I love doing that when I get roles. I, I prefer doing that. I prefer having something that I can, I can take outside of me and, and uh, meld with who I am and, and create something, create something completely different. And so that's what I did with her. I, there's all, you know, all the footage I could find. I looked at all the footage. There's all these grainy YouTube footage, grainy YouTube footage of her. I looked at that, I studied it. I got up in the morning when I was in hair and makeup. I'm looking at that. When I went to bed at night, I'm looking at it. Um, then there's all this amazing audio of Dr. Maddie and Christine our director found this incredible audio of Dr. Maddie conducting this workshop. Uh, and so I would study that and I would study it so much to, I would study it trying to sound like her as much as I could, right? So Dr. Maddie, like all of the Clark sisters, they all have, kind of have this kind of raspy voice that they have, right? And so I was try, trying to get that and trying to sustain that. And I couldn't. 
And so one of the things that I would do was I would, I would scream in a pillow or I would go into the closet. If we were shooting in a house, I would go in the closet and I would scream in the closet because I was trying to injure my voice so I could sound like Dr. Maddie sounded. Um, and I was annoying and people looked at me like I was crazy, but I was like, I don't care because I'm trying to do this right. So I'm going to be that chick that's going to holler in closets. So you just got to bear with me. And that's what I did. And that was unsuccessful. There's only a couple times where you hear me and I do sound like her. But what I could achieve, what I could do was capture her, her sense of authority. And so Dr. Maddie, like a lot of women during that time, they, they spoke with certainty and they had to because they didn't have the luxury of digression. Right. So now we got a little more money. We got a little more access so we can we can be languorous about our language. But they didn't have that because, you know, women weren't allowed space. So black women weren't, you know, imagine that how much space black women could take in the world. So Dr. Maddie, when she had that space, she had to use that space. She had to, she had to speak in authority. You listen to someone like Fannie Lou Hamer. Right. When you hear Fannie Lou Hamer, Fannie Lou Hamer's sentences don't go up at the end and end up in questions. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? She, does, she doesn't say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, she doesn't do that. She says, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. She speaks with authority. Dr. Maddie speaks with authority. So that's what I could do. I could always, when I when, went with my dialogue, um, speak with, with authority. And I just tried to lean into that as much as I could. Having Kiera um, as part of the cast, did that help inform you a little bit? Having the granddaughter, you know, being able to kind of be like, oh, that's, that's like my grandma. Uh, I was, it was, I was, I was nervous at first. I was nervous at first, but Kiera, you know, was very, very generous. I asked her a question one time and she was like, I don't know. And I was like, okay, all right. That means do it yourself, you know? And so she, she and, and the Clark sisters as well, they kind of, and Christine and Holly can speak to this. They really, they really gave us, you know, uh, I wouldn't say free reign, but they gave us a lot of, a lot of space to make this, to make the, to tell the story the way that we, to honor them, of course, and be respectful and honor the facts of their life. But in terms of what we created, they really, you know, they really gave us the, they really gave us the space to do that. And that's a good point because I think when people um, see some biopics, sometimes they're sanitized and people might not expect to see everything that we saw. And especially, you know, the difficulties between um, the mother and the daughters, um, the, the um, difficult marriages and so forth. Um, Christine and Holly, can you speak to um, the Clark sisters and how you got their trust in, in order to tell their story and to have so much of um, their life and them tell you um, what they went through? I think the first, you know, hat I always wear going into something that is from a bio pick standpoint is the manager hat. You know, I spent a lot of my years managing and still managing and working with the family. And of course, Kiara, I had to appeal to um, that part. I had to appeal to the family part. I've been a part of that family uh, close to 20 years. And so, you know, even going in, asking them to trust me with their story, you know, I had to <clears throat> solicit their trust in me. To, you know, to make sure that they knew, A, I was not going to exploit them. I wasn't going to exploit the Church of God in Christ, of which I am a part. And neither would I, um, you know, exploit our faith system. You know, we are all women believers. I mean, all of us are, are believers here. And so even when it came to those elements of the story that were incredibly sensitive, um, I had to remind them. Now you said you was gonna trust me. You you got you gotta let me go there. You don't you don't want this to be an after school special, now do you? You're gonna have to let me tell a little bit of your story. 
And so they were willing. But when I say I made sure that they worked with every element of change, there were no surprises. Uh, I couldn't afford that. And I also had to uh, answer to lifetime. So I had to make sure that whatever we deviated from or whatever we added to, that it was a team effort. Even when we were, when uh, uh, Anjanu and Christine and I were changing the script in the wee hours of the night in the freezing cold of Canada, they were always uh, you know, abreast on what we were doing. And you gotta have their trust in order to tell stories like this. Um, so when, when, I, when, I came, when I came to the story as a director, um, they don't know me from Adam. So um, I, I met them by introduction by um, Holly and Ronnie Petrie, um, you know, who's a producer who works with Holly. And I think because they trusted Holly and Ronnie, they, they, tr they naturally trusted me. So it, it seems like that's the natural progression. Then my job as a director is to just blow it up in their faces pretty much and, and, and let them know that I'm not Holly, I'm not Ronnie. I'm, I'm the person responsible for telling your story in the way that I know that you want to be seen. In order for me to do that, there is an element of truth that I have to apply to this that may not be comfortable for you. So let's start having those discussions. And one of the first things that I asked each and every one of them was, what is your testimony? What is your specific testimony that you would want to share with me so I have that as a guiding point as to how I'm going to reach into this story and express it for the masses. Because what you think is not how I'm thinking, but what you want is what I want. But I have to do it in the way that I do it as, as a director and as a storyteller. And it may not be familiar to you and it may be uncomfortable at times. But if you trust what I can do in terms of my job, then you will, then you will be pleased with the outcome. And I think with that kind of understanding and um, kumbaya approach, um, we were able to, to achieve that and more. Um, can you point to um, a part or a scene that was probably the, um, the more difficult or the most difficult to kind of get their trust in order to make sure that this went off, off the right way? Well, I think once we have that initial discussion, um, I think they were kind of like, okay, like we, we met Christine, she's a, a, a fireball, we get it, um, you know, carry on and, and, we, and, and we trust Holly and, and Ronnie and, and of course Donald Lawrence, who um, is a great family friend and their personal music producer. And we just, they, their, their sentiment was like, we, we, we believe we're in good hands, carry on. So that, that was kind of like how we left off. Cool. Um, I do want to bring in Donald um, um, to talk about the music. And when I was watching it, um, for, at first I didn't realize that all these women were really singing, which was amazing to me. Like their voices, and it's just like, oh my God. Like in a red album, I was like, they really are singing and they're saying so amazing. Um, tell me why that was so important in an age where, you know, we see like so many things lip synced. Well, actually, um, originally it was going to be lip synced. Um, the Clark sisters were going to call the vocals and um, the actors were going to lip to it. Christine hates lip sync. So she called me and she said, <laughs> Dono, can you get these ladies to sound like the Clark sisters? And I said, well, who did you cast? And I went through the cast and I kind of knew some of them. I knew where I might have some challenges with some of the voices, not that they couldn't sing, it was in this particular type of singing. So I reached out to a couple of them, gave them some guidance on what we we're gonna have to do to find the voices. Cause finding a voice is like finding a character too, especially when it's such a character voice. And Clark sisters have character voices. They don't just sing. Karen, no one really sounds like Karen. And definitely no one really sounds like Dorinda, it's Dorinda or no one. So after speaking with them, and I, I felt confident that I could, I, it was either this. Well, I told Christine, well, Christine said, we either gonna have a big win or a big fail. And I said, we wasn't gonna fail. I wasn't gonna drown, especially knowing the Clark Sisters fans and um, how much of a beehive they have. I was like, I can't, I can't miss this. So once we got in it, um, you know, I think after the first song, 
I was able to talk to everyone, help them find the placement and do it. And it was live from then. And that's what you got. And they, they really mimicked them to the point to where it really sounded like the Clark sisters about 20 years ago. And um, I wanted everybody to feel like I felt when I heard them in the eighties. And that's what we were going for. And that's why it feels so much like this. Very, very organic and very authentic. It must have been amazing to be on set and to hear these women go through the runs and go through all this and and hit these notes. Yeah, you know, like Christine and, 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 and Holly, everyone's so detailed with this, we were all that way. So I gave them every last run. Like when we, when we were learning the songs, I knew these songs backwards and forwards because I was so obsessed with the cards growing up. I knew exactly where this ran went so that it would sound like then. And so we all went through that. And if they went somewhere different, I was like, no, it's not that, it's this. And um, um, Jackie, your voice got to have air right here. Dorinda, you got to have the rest right here. You can't be clean because Shalea usually works with um, David Foster. She does a lot of Whitney Houston stuff. And Whitney is a totally different type of singer than Dorinda is. So once Shalea found Dorinda's voice, it stayed the whole entire time. All of them, really. Um, even Christina, Christina, who played Twinkie, really sings more soprano, where Twinkie is the contralto of the group. She got range, but she really holds the bottom down a lot. So I had to get um, um, Christine to also hold that down, also to sing with Twinkie's straight tone, which is really highly influenced by her love with Stevie Wonder. He's a very straight tone type of singer. So I would just talk to him about all those different things. And when you put that whole recipe together, it just started sounding like Vintage Clark. I remember when we first heard the first song, um, I played it back to them. They couldn't believe it was them. They, they was like, oh my God, we sound just like them. And remember, it's five strangers who never sang together. Some of them didn't even know each other. So it was, it was a big task to get them to sing like one of the best group vocal groups in the world. And they're all strangers. And we had like 14 days to do it. So, you know, it's, it was crazy, but it was, I'm really proud of it. I'm really proud of them. They, they, they nailed it. Uh, the whole entire creative team. Um, I imagine it must have been a task for you to, going through the catalog to pick which songs we're going to be featured and which you know, what we're going to be the anchor of different scenes and so forth. I mean, can you talk a little bit about picking the, the, the music? Well, I think that was also like a, it was Ronnie and Holly, all of us kind of worked, and Christine, all of us worked together on the song. I definitely had my opinion about it. I had my opinion as a fan. But then when I got into the story, the one thing I think about music is it has to move the story forward. So you have to take your fan hat off and make sure that the song that you choose move the story forward. Um, the song that we, one song I challenged them a little bit on was um, If You Can't Take It. I, I wasn't, I, I didn't think it was a great song at first, but then once I kind of saw the scene, I asked them to let me stretch a little bit. So I kind of colored it a little, a little differently than the, the original version, but I colored it towards the scene that they made. And I ended up liking that one as one of my favorite moments in, in, in the movie because it looks so much like the scene and it helped push that story of them in the studio and Dorinda finding her voice and then working with their Uncle Bill. And it just felt like that time and adding the horns to it, the grittiness to it, it just really made it just such a great, a great, great moment for me. So it was really um, about making sure we got songs that push the story forward. And with my background in musical theater, I really understand how a song happens to sing. But you know, when you're a fan and they got such great catalog, it's just hard, hard to choose. But I think we did a good job of picking the right numbers to move this particular story forward. Okay, I, I wanna go back to Anjanu because um, you've been, you know, you're a veteran actress and been around for, for a while, for so long, for a while, and done so many, much great work, and, but you have gotten so much attention for this. I was reading um, a Washington Post article that talked about how like this might be your biggest role yet. Um, talk a little bit about the responses to this role, especially with all the amazing work you've done in your career. And why do you think you, um, this role has sort of um, captured um, people's attention so? Well, I mean, the, this playing this part uh, in this in this movie is incredibly incredibly sentimental for me because I I I worship the Clark sisters I worship them and I you know I I've said this a few times but I'm not lying when I said that I I stalked them there was a period in in <laughs> the early 2010s where I was stalking them because I was working in Detroit doing these jobs and so on my days off. I would be trying to find out where the Clark sisters were and I would just show up and just pray to God that they would walk past me 
or sing a song or something, you know? And so <laughs> the fact that I'm a bona fide stalker of these women, and then someone says, oh, we, here you go, you're going to play their mama, you know? <laughs> Is it's it's strange? It's cosmic beyond my beyond my beyond my belief. But I accepted it. I accepted it. So there's a great deal of sentimentality uh, attached to, for me uh, to 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 do this role. I mean, just incredible sense of it. And it's so weird. Like I text them. You know what I mean? And I have a moment of like, hold up. I'm texting Karen Clark. Where's my life now? My life is not like this a year and a half ago. You know. <laughs> So anyway, so far as why people are responding to this movie, I, I just, you know, I think what's really incredible is that a, a couple of things. One is that what Christine and 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 Donald uh, and and Holly and 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 Shalea Frazier and Raven Goodwin and Christina Bell and Angela Burchett and uh, who am I leaving out, y'all? Who am I leaving yeah, out? Here. Sierra yeah. Shears, my granddaughter, Sierra Shears. Um, what we were able to, what, able, what we were able to do was create something that had a documentary feel to it, right? So there are tons of uh, great performances on screen where you have someone playing, playing a, a famous singer. You know, Judy Garland, you have, well, you have a famous singer playing a role, right? You have Judy Garland in A Star is Born, Barbara Streisand in A Star is Born, Lady Gaga in A Star is Born, you know? And then you have uh, you have uh, Marion, Marion Cotillard in, in uh, La Vie en Rose. And with Judy Garland particularly, Judy Garland could blow everybody out of the water. She could sing her tail off, but even she, even Judy Garland, when she was singing, in the stars born, she had backing tracks. So with Christine deciding to this insisting on these young women singing live, what you had was sort of this documentary feel to it, right? So what we were able to achieve is something like uh, on par with what Mae the Staples did in the last waltz, what Aretha Franklin did in uh, Amazing Grace. Uh, what you know, these gospel, this great, that great gospel documentary, uh, say amen, somebody, right? These, you, what you were seeing was happening live in front of everybody, everybody. And so, when I was in that room with Sierra Sheard, you know, in that hospital room with Sierra Sheard, and those girls were singing, there was no, there was no radio, and there was no, you know, speaker coming through that, coming through that hotel, that hospital room. That was them on the spot singing. When they were singing at the, at the beginning of that movie, that was them on the spot singing. No backing tracks, nothing. There was no safety net for these young women at all, at all. So what I was affected by, I think, is what the world was affected by when they saw it. You have to have a cold heart to listen to these young women unpaint the walls singing the way they did and not be affected by that. So really, honestly, it made my job easy because I, my, heart, my heart was moved and affected every time they opened their voices. And, 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 and I, I, I cannot say enough that this is what sets us apart from what, what has been done in movies for the last 10 years so as far as, as musical biopics. <laughs> what we have done with the Clark sisters is 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 unmatched in terms of what we have done with those women singing live, um, and I went off I went off course with that, but I think it's important to say I think it's important to say that what those young women did with with Christine's direction is something that has not been matched in any biopic in in, in I think in the history of biopics. And I have to say what Lifetime allowed us to do in telling the story, the way we were able to tell it, uh, was also a bit unmatched because we did some things that were a bit unorthodox, you know, when it came to midnight uh, changing of script, flipping up scenes, 
pushing this here, pulling that there in order to get what we knew was authentic. And so when you have partnerships like that, that allow you to really tell the story the way it needs to be told, um, it just, you know, it all comes out um, the way it's supposed to. And I, I think, you know, I always, my hope was that this film would inspire um, families to stick together. It would in inspire women of faith. It would inspire mothers to encourage their children to go after their dream. Um, and at the end of the day, that the music would um, bring people together and that the music would bring healing. And in the time in which the movie was released, um, it couldn't have been better because it absolutely connected, it inspired and it uplifted in a time when we were in trouble. And we still in trouble. So <laughs> we are still and thank God we still got the music. <laughs> All Amazon. All Amazon right now. Thank, thank God we still have the music. <laughs> I think it's also um, key to note that um, you had um, a movie about Black women produced by Black women, directed by Black women, but I think also um, written by Black women, or, and you had very key roles with Black women. Talk a little bit about the importance of that. Um, I think it's time for our voice. In front of the camera, behind the camera, um, holding the pen, um, any way we can get our gift and our voice out, it's time for that. It's been time for that. But I, I think in, in the time in which we live now, it was important that this project um, be representative of the story that it was telling. And so that meant a Black woman director, that meant Black producers, um, that meant uh, African-American people, people of color in the crew. Um, it meant people who were that editing. It meant the same for people who were doing the music. I mean, this story has heart and it has soul and everything that touches it needed to represent the same. And so, you know, from speaking from, you know, the one who carried the baby uh, in my loins for over 15 years, that was my goal that it absolutely uh, represented what it stood for uh, at the top, the back, the bottom, and, and, and above. And I'm so proud that we were able to um, bring it to life um, in real color, pun intended. And not only did you bring it to life, but it did so well and was one of the biggest um, um, movies for a lifetime, but also just in um, in cable in general over the last um, few years. Were you were you guys surprised by the reaction, Christine? I think um, I, I think we were surprised by the numbers, but um, as a director who was standing on set when some of the emotions were coming to life. Um, and, and that's how I'd like to work as a director is um, um, I, I start, I'm, I'm gonna use a, an example from Anjan. I start from the inside out in terms of preparation, but when I'm on set, it becomes outside in in terms of what I'm receiving. And a lot of times when I, I was emotionally like floored um, by what, what the girls and Anjanu uh, were giving me, and I had an inkling that this is, this is unique and this is special. So I understood, that's all I understood. Um, the result and the outcome is none of my business. So when it came out the way that it did and we got the numbers that we got, I was absolutely floored. And up until the day that it was released, Anjanu and I would have conversations about like, um, gosh, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what people are gonna think. And, and, and then to see the response was, 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 was truly a, a, a kiss by God. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, Dr. Maddie Clark has, you know, resonated with so many people. Could you ever see um, spinning off her life um, and, and doing like 
the pre prequel, like what her life was before, because she, you know, obviously her backstory, her story for daughters was amazing, but her backstory, I'm sure, is um, must be pretty um, spectacular as well. There was a lot we didn't tell that we <laughs> could. So yeah, most definitely, and 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 I will say this as it relates to, you know, the surprise. All I can say is when I thought it wasn't going to happen, I have now learned, you know, delay definitely does not mean denied. Was there ever a point where you kind of thought like, you know, I just, I don't think this is going to happen. Like, and just like, you know, let me just put that in the, uh, you know, why do I keep on like, you said you've worked with this for 15 years. When, why did you not just say, hey, let me just move on to something else? You know, because when God gives you a vision, it's your job to carry it through. And yes, there were times when I felt like, now Lord, you said this, so what's happening? This is taking entirely too long. But it just, you know, you know, there's a, there's a time and a season for everything. And when the time was right for this, you know, it was to come forth. There's something that I live by constantly and it's, um, it's a scripture and it says, would God bring you to a point of delivery and then close up your womb? Would he bring you to a point of birthing and then not allow you to deliver? And the answer to that is no. It might take, the pushing process might be laborious. It may take forever, but when it comes forth, there's your blessing. And, you know, we've got to learn that sometimes we got to wait. Yeah, vision may carry for a while, but um, it was speaking, never lie. Yeah, never a, lie. Vision, a vision, when you write it, it tarries sometimes for a while, but it'll speak and it'll never lie. That's so right. it's already spoken, it was supposed to be, the tarry doesn't mean it's not going to happen. The tarry means just the tarry, but once it's spoken, it's not going to lie, it's not coming past. And that's always, it's the same kind of thing. That's something that I live by. The vision may tarry, but it, it'll speak and it won't lie. Uh, I think oh, it's God, it's speaking of scriptures, the scripture that comes to mind is is vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And and the reason why this particularly resonates with me is that when you think of what Dr. Maddie Moss Clark represented and had to push through in spite of everyone who tried to put her down, who tried to dim her light. And her voice was not, I think, as, as um, luminescent as it could have been, if not for those types of, of hardships. I just, I'm just so happy now that people can see who she was and what she represented um, being um, a brilliant Black woman who was gifted and endowed with talents and an anointing that came directly from God and who never... Um, back down on what her assignment was. And she was, she was revolutionary in the way that she did it. And, and perhaps in her time, um, maybe people outside of her circle could not see that and appreciate that. And I think in this movie, I just believe that God allowed Dr. Maddie Moss Clark um, to be seen in, in the proper way. Um, and especially in the Black Lives Matter movement where Black voices are, are just so necessary right now and Black female voices that we see an example of someone who was a luminary figure who was way ahead of her time and who was probably deemed difficult. Like how many times do we hear that label of Black women who are visionary being labeled as difficult? She wasn't difficult. She was visionary and she was for, she came from another place in, an, in another time and, and she, 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 she stayed um, faithful to, to her calling. And I just believe in the way that God allowed this film to be seen and appreciated by, by the masses that people get to understand that you know, she was not a difficult woman. She was visionary, and I'm glad other people can experience and see that. Can um, I speak to that? Oh, yes, can I yes. Speak to that a little bit, and I'm, I'm going to take the secular route. <laughs> we'll take the That's secular right. route. <laughs> with this. Um, I, I think that, you know, for, for, you know, Black women in general, 
you know, I've been reading a lot about this, this, uh, this artist, this writer named Carson McCullers. Carson McCullers wrote this book called, uh, she wrote tons of books, but she wrote a, a play called The Member of a Wedding that Ethel Waters starred in. And in talking about, um, um, in, 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 in reading this book, it's a lot about how, how women have had to fight against invisibility, right? And so that this fight, uh, women fighting against the invisibility is amplified when you are an artist. So, um, so when you are an artist, it's, it's not just that you have to fight against invisibility, you have to fight against the fact that the word, the word being a woman and artist should even be in the same sentence, right? So imagine that and be a, being a black woman in the mid 20th century. And so, so that's what, that's what Dr. Maddie was. That's what the Clark sisters, that's what the Clark sisters were. And, you know, uh, Donald and Christine and Holly and my, can all attest that in our trying to talk about the magnificence of this movie and sell it and try to get people to watch it and so on and so forth, we have to spend probably the first 10 or 15 minutes explaining why someone should care about the Clark sisters. And we, we what, so what we end up doing before we even, before we get to talk about our work, we have to justify someone's interest in the Clark sisters. And so what that says to me and what that says should say to all of us as, 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 as people who, black women who are creating is that we are still fighting invisibility that right now, two weeks ago, a white question, a white interviewer said, so why should we care about this musical group that's not on the forefront? Mm -hmm. Now, 50 years from now, if someone wants to write a story or do a musical about, do a biopic of, of Bob Dylan, no one is going to ask that question. If someone wants to do a, a biopic of Bruce Springsteen, no one is going to ask that question. It's just going to be understood that this is significant. And so you can use your time and your interview talking about your work, the value of your work as a filmmaker, as a producer, as a music producer, as, a, as, a, as an actor. But we don't have that, we don't have that space. So it's really been an interesting thing, an interesting journey. I feel what the Clark sisters went through. I feel what Dr. Maddie went through because they had to go through the same thing within this sort of patriarchal um, society, which was the Church of God in Christ, which was America as we know it then and America as we know it now. So I, I, I hope that I, I, I wanted this movie to be a love letter to the Clark sisters, but more so I wanted this movie to be a love letter to the, the genius of black women. And I, I, I you know, in terms of timing and where we are, that unfortunately is timeless. We're gonna always have to keep fighting that battle of invisibility, you know? That's right. Yeah. You know, I think that's a such a good point because it brings me to um, like the Mickey Howard story that you did, Chris, Christine. I grew up loving Mickey Howard, but when it was um, made into a movie, I was like, wow. Like, I didn't think that her life would be, get a chance to be told because she was an R&B singer, didn't that wasn't like Whitney Houston or something. But her her story was, and you did very well. And we got a chance to to see that. But you don't necessarily get a chance to see some of the black women who have made such an impact have their stories told. Do you think that because of the success that you got, you have had and this project has had, that this maybe opens the doors for us to be able to tell the stories of other black artists, particularly women artists, a little bit maybe easier, an easier role that maybe won't take 15 years or so. A absolutely, and I think it is incumbent upon us um, to try and, and to keep doing it. Like, I was so inspired by um, this particular story and Mickey Howard in such a way that, I, you know, I was allowed to go into their lives and I was trusted to then put it on the screen and the fact that it helps to be successful, let's just say that, in, the, in this, this business that we're in, um, when you do things well, then it seems like you can do that again. So um, I did Mickey Howard well, I did this well, I just pray I do the next one well, but I'm inspired 
um, oh, to keep trying. I, I'm, I'm inspired to keep doing it because the what I feel after having told these Black women's stories is um, I felt I feel like a credit to my race, and that means <laughs> everything to me. It absolutely means everything to me that my cousins from Detroit were like. Dang, cuz, you did it. You did the thing on that Mickey Howard story on, on the Clark Sisters movie. That means everything. So I will continue to use that creative capital to tell and elevate Black women's stories and do it well. It's just not, it's just not enough just to do it. We have exactly. to do it well. Right. And I don't feel pressure in terms of doing it well. Like, right, Donald? Like, you don't feel yeah. pressure. It's, it's like, it's what we do. Right. Let us keep doing it and give me, give me some real money to do it, you know, <laughs> and, 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 and let's see what yeah. kind of damage I, I can make in terms of ratings with some real money, you know, and real time and not a snowstorm in Toronto. <laughs> a lot of people, just to add to the narrative of powerful women, we, we talked about Dr. Clark, we talked about the sisters, but one thing I need to really point out that it kind of gets missing in this narrative is Twinkie was one of the few female producers happening back then too. It was like Patrice Russian and maybe Angela Winbush, but Twinkie was, there were no female producers like producing records. And um, as much as Twinkie might've been a little passive with her mom, she was very aggressive with making records for the sisters that she was producing by herself. And still to this day, I don't know pretty hardly any female producers all the way around is very few and she was nailing it i mean from from the from the big record she just was really nailing it and i was always so fascinated with her gift growing up she was somebody i just studied in in and out just just how she approached her create her her lyrics her her unique creative um but i i really think i looked over the fact that hey she was really one of the only few female producers happening around it not just gospel but just all the way around I was say when I was watching the movie, I think one of the most heartbreaking parts was when we realized that she gave up her masters for the Cadillac. And it just yeah. like I think about that today and it's like, oh my God, because she made so many amazing and wrote so many amazing songs and produced. Yeah. So that happened um, to so many black writers though. That a lot mm -hmm. of them guys they didn't understand the difference of how valuable publishing was. A lot of people didn't get the training to understand that publishing is like real estate and that it continues to just grow. They just think of it as a song, but it's really like, it's intellectual property, it's really real estate. But you know, she got her, she got, she got her, her publishing back. So later on, she did get it back and they paid her retroactively. So she did get it back, but a lot, so many black writers on all, all sides really, you know, lost a lot of publishing back in the 60s, 70s and before. They didn't understand the value of publishing. Mm, yeah, um, I will say, I think it's towards the end when we see the Clark sisters embraced with um, members of the cast, it was such a beautiful moment and you get a chance to see that um, they really um, appreciated the love that was given to um, their story. And, um, you know, I'm sure you have, you, you talked to them during it and afterwards, um, what was the feeling when you know when it premiered and they saw how much people responded uh i will just say they were excited you know they were they always call, call me and say holly you put us back on the map i'm like no you were always on the map you were always on the map people just needed to be reminded of the greatness that you all represent in your music and who you are as women, African-American women, Christian women, women of faith, just women, period. And, but just watching the story, they cried so much, they laughed so much. Um, even when they visited the set, they cried like babies, you know, watching, looking at Anjanou feeling like their mother. It was just a, it was a sur really surreal moment to watch them experience this movie live up close and personal and um you know it was very it was very special but they have been overwhelmed by the success when you turn on social media that that's all that's all you see clack 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 so you know um this is their time and i for one am personally happy and proud for them to have this moment 
And they killed on BBC last night. Yes, that yeah. was amazing. Was yes, they did. Was Thank you. Great closing. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. That was wonderful. Well, this has been absolutely amazing. Um, on behalf of the African American Film Critics Association and Nikessa Moody from The Hollywood Reporter, we sincerely want to thank each of you for your time, your effort, your creativity, your genius. Anjanou, Holly, Christine, Donald, uh, uh, definitely after TV honors are coming up, so definitely mark your calendars. The Save the Dates will be going out shortly. Um, we are absolutely we're mesmerized by uh, the performance. And I mean, all of you have consistently delivered throughout uh, the years that I've known, well, three of the four. And Donald, you too. I've, I've been a fan for quite a long time. Nikessa, any final thoughts, any final comments? No, I just want to say it was such a, um, such a joy to be able to talk to you guys and also just to see the film um, when I was watching it. Um, it was just, I learned so much about the Clark sisters. So um, thank you for bringing that to us. Holly, do you think we want to do social media tags, our, our handles uh, oh, for yeah. the folks? Who, uh, why don't you share those with the audience? Uh, it's the Clark Sisters movie. Uh, and then it was the Clark Sisters. And it was the First Ladies of Gospel. OK. And if each of you want to share your own uh, social handles, you know, feel free to. Uh, I'm at, at Dr. Holly Carter. Uh, Donald? Um, I'm at, on IG, I'm at, at Donald Lawrence, Twitter, at Donald Lawrence, Facebook, um, at Donald Lawrence Music, and DonaldLawrence.com um, website. Anjanou? I, I'm, I don't have a social girl. like it. You're not a social girl. Yeah. You don't like it. All right, we got you, we got you. And I don't know, Christine. Um, I, I'm C Swanson 44 on all platforms and Christine Swanson on, on Facebook. And what about you, Ms. Moody? Um, on Twitter, um, Nikessa Moody, and the same thing on Instagram. Terrific. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Right. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you all. Sure do appreciate it.